We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll take that as the cue for me to go ahead and start. So welcome to this working with this workshop of the Internet Governance Forum number 269 titled Inclusive Governance Models of Open Source Participation. My name is Mala Kumar and I'm the director of Tech for Social Good on the GitHub Social Impact team of a tech company called GitHub, which is a Microsoft owned company where more than 73 million people, um, software developers globally choose to collaborate on and host their code. GitHub is the platform of choice for the majority of the world's open source tools, applications, and projects, including in the public sector and in the social sector. And in fact, much of my team's focus on, is on open source capacity building in the social sector, which includes all organizations working on the sustainable development goals. You can read more about our work at socialimpact.github.com. So today I have the privilege of moderating the session and I'll be joined by, I think three, because unfortunately um, Saeed Chaudhary is unable to join us today, but three esteemed panelists covering a broad range of work in open source governance. Uh, so the panelists are Samson Gadi, co-founder of Open Source Community Africa, Kriti Mittal, entrepreneur and residence of Midiar Network India, and Dushan Milo Venovich, the lead uh, health intelligence architect of the World Health Organization. So welcome panelists, thank you so much for being here. I'd also like to thank this section's rapporteur, uh, my GitHub policy colleague, Peter Xi'an. Hi, Peter. So this session will last about uh, one hour, and in a minute, I'll highlight a couple of the uh, global challenges we see in open source governance before turning it over to our panelists, who will each have about five minutes to speak about their work. We'll then have 25 minutes for question and answers before closing out the panel, and audience members during the Q&A, you can use the raise hand feature on Zoom, and I'll recognize you to add questions. And I believe Peter's in the room to field any questions in the room itself. Um, so with that, let's turn to a couple of points on open source governance, and I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Um, all right, so a lot of challenges and opportunities we see in open source software governance overlap with I think broader internet governance. And this might be in part explained by the fact that a lot of the modern internet is really fueled by open source software. Um, there are kind of a lot of ways that we can think about these two terms, but for the purposes of today's session, we're gonna to refer to open source software as tools or applications whose code is publicly available on the internet and under an open source initiative OSI license that permits the user to use, study, change, or distribute the source code. And then for, um, Internet governance, we use the UN Sec Secretary General's working group um, definition, and the term refers to the development and applications by governments, the private sector and civil society, and their respective roles of shared principles, norms, rules, and decision-making procedures and programs that shape the evaluation and use of the internet. So a bit of a mouthful, but just so we're all on the same page. Um, so it is important to note that there are differences in how open source software is produced and used in the social sector and the public sector than the corporate sector writ large, which now in modern era is the biggest contributor to open source software. One of those issues really is around funding in the social sector it tends to be around new software projects rather than strengthening existing tools and solutions, which makes open source software and its governance challenging. Um, the social sector also tends to focus on open source software with graphical user interfaces as a standalone application, meaning that there's some kind of interface that allows a person to manipulate the code or to perform a function without actually touching the code. Whereas uh, open source software and corporate tech tends to be something like infrastructure tech that doesn't necessarily have that GUI. Uh, OSS, open source software, is also perceived differently in countries. So we're currently running a project now uh, focusing on four low and middle income countries, including in India, Kenya, Egypt, and Mexico. And we've seen because of the way that uh, tech ecosystems have evolved over the decades, there's a different association with open source software. In the United States and Europe, there still tends to be a democratic association, where, whereas, it, for example, in India, the majority of the people we spoke to, software developers, really associate open source software with corporations because that's how they were oriented into that, that field. 
And then finally, it's important to note that many open source tools and applications are meant to be deployed that are meant to be deployed in low and middle income countries are built in high income countries. And so inclusive design and participation, especially in the era of remote work where it's harder to get to field based operations are major obstacles. All right, so um, our panel today has a really fascinating geographic approach to their work. And so if Samson is on the line, I'd love to turn it over to him to talk about his work with Open Source Africa. Samson, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. All right, please go ahead. Oh, oh great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Samson Gadi. I am the co-founder for the Open Source Community Africa. Uh, it's a initiative that um, I and my friends created roughly around four years um, to define and lead conversations around, you know, the way open source is perceived, um, while also trying to define what open source means in the, in the continent of Africa, we basically focus around awareness, so giving, um, you know, people the opportunity to understand open source to its in-depth, you know, from software to community to licensing to governance. Um, so one of the things that is quite interesting um, within the organization is the fact that we it's sort of like centered around through the connect effect, which is the uh, I believe Samson might have dropped off. Um, yeah, that's a good suggestion. So everybody who's on the Zoom call, if you don't mind switching off your video to save bandwidth for those of us in lower bandwidth areas. Okay, um, I, I think Samson has dropped off. So why don't we go to Creepy actually? And please tell us about your work in India and then we'll bring Samson back in. Sure, thanks Mala. Uh, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Great, hi everyone. I'm Kriti Mittal. I work at Omidya Network India uh, where I lead the initiative on uh, open digital ecosystems. Uh, as a philanthropic uh, impact investing firm, uh, we invest in both for-profits and non-profits um, and also support government efforts and research in sectors like education, financial inclusion, um, emerging technology and digital society. Oh, sorry, Peter, I just saw your message. I thought we were to turn our videos off. Um, uh, anyway, hi, hi again, everyone. So just to give a bit of a, um, I think Samson is back. Do you want me to continue? Yeah, go ahead. And then once Samson is up, we can go. Thanks. Sure. Uh, so the Open Digital Ecosystems or ODE initiative, um, you know, really focuses on population scale digital infrastructure. So, for example, things like digital identity, digital payments, uh, data infrastructure uh, as the sort of horizontals and any uh, large scale government to citizen um, digital platforms. Uh, across sectors like healthcare, education, uh, you know, urban governance, agriculture, etc., as the sort of verticals, uh, and so our work sort of spans, uh, you know, both these axes. Um, and the context in which we began this work, uh, you know, is really that in India, uh, you know, digital infrastructure has seen a paradigm shift uh, in the last few years, um, from what used to be these end-to-end -end tech systems uh, existing in silos uh, to what to what we are seeing now, which is a much more um, sort of open tech, uh, you know, paradigm uh, where there's uh, there's an emerging understanding uh, that digital infrastructure should be modular, you know, should be open source uh, and should have open APIs, etc. Um, and this whole story really began with uh, with Aadhaar and UPI uh, in India, which is the digital ID and and payments rails, uh, but has now become the sort of go to model uh, to build gov tech, uh, you know, across sectors. So now we have these. Um, government-led uh, digital infrastructure missions, such as the National Digital Health Mission, as well as some interesting open protocol-led approaches coming up as well, uh, such as the Open Network for Digital Commerce. Um, and while this new approach is, is you know, much more collaborative and therefore um, has the ability to reach a large scale quickly, it also poses uh, some big risks, especially since um, you know, the regulatory landscape uh, here in India is still evolving. Um, we are yet to sort of uh, fully put in place laws around, uh, you know, the flow of personal data as well as non-personal data uh, and, and protections around both. Um, and so the perspective that we're really trying to bring through our ODE work um, is a greater emphasis on uh, what, what we refer to as the non-tech layers of digital infrastructure, uh, which is essentially the, the governance and community uh, building layers. 
um and just to you know um you know maybe i'll not go into the framework uh, much in my opening remarks and maybe come back to it in the discussion but just to give a couple of examples to make uh, make this you know a bit more tangible so one of the efforts uh, that we are supporting here is to create an open data platform uh, for all public data uh, that can act as a kind of base layer uh, for all kinds of open source innovation that can happen on top of it uh, this is called ndap or the national uh, data analytics platform and is being developed by uh, niti aayog which is india's uh, planning body and and government think tank um and what ndap will do is it's going to offer all government data uh, mapped to a common schema so essentially common uh, you know geographical and temporal identifiers um and and then sort of offer all of these data sets up in a user friendly uh platform so that you can easily sort of do analysis across population scale data sets which are currently sitting in, in departmental silos uh another one that uh, that we've supported is an urban governance platform uh, developed by a nonprofit called the egov foundation uh this is now being used by hundreds of municipalities uh or city governments across the country um to provide a range of sort of digital services to residents um from grievance redressal to sort of property tax collection to building plan uh, approvals etc uh, and it's completely open source um and you know in these and and many other such platforms um the technology part is not is not really rocket science you know what we've seen is that that a lot of effort is needed uh, in getting the the design and implementation right for the governance and community layers um for instance should there mandatorily be a public body that acts as the institutional home of a digital platform that serves so many people now uh, if not then who should be held accountable and how uh, you know do we need uh, new laws and regulations to prevent exclusion of people who are on the other side of the digital divide now that these platforms are mediating you know essential services as well and how do we protect citizens data uh, while at the same time encouraging open source uh, innovation these are some of the sort of critical questions um that we are hoping to sort of uh, support more work on Uh, and in addressing these kind of issues um, you know a huge role is played by open source communities um in in sort of building uh, inclusive open digital ecosystems uh, not only do they help build and maintain uh, this critical infrastructure they've also been um creating the the localized and and context specific um you know solutions and use cases on top of the core digital infrastructure um and secondly you know oss communities play a big role in ensuring transparency and accountability uh just to give a quick example the platforms that the indian government uh used for contact tracing uh, during the pandemic and vaccine coordination uh were both made open source after some pressure from civil society groups uh and now open source volunteer developers have been contributing to sort of catching and fixing bugs in these platforms as well as highlighting and exposing you know issues of data privacy Uh, so much so that the government stakeholders themselves are now uh, acknowledging and recognizing the potential of open source and acknowledging uh, you know that that making that open sourcing these platforms led to many improvements uh, i think let me stop here and you know would love to hear from the other speakers uh, and perhaps in the discussion i can uh, talk a bit more about the sort of current challenges and opportunities for open source in india great thanks so much priti Um I believe Samson is back on. So Samson if you'd like to continue and I will go off the camera to to help with the bandwidth sure. situation. <laughs> sure, sorry. I'm still traveling. Um yeah, um I like said I lead a project called or organization called the Open Source Community Africa. Originally started um as um, in early 20 late 2017 and the reason why we started creating the Open Source Community Africa was just for the opportunity to get to connect you know the rest of africa it's open source like i mentioned earlier before i went off um you know diversity is something that is super huge and as being an open source maintainer myself uh, and contributing to a lot of projects that are based in us or western centric um projects there's a lot of misconception about like how open source or how open source contributors from africa are like in terms of data for example some projects only support things like afrikaans which is like one language in south africa and definitely not you know people in west africa because i'm nigerian so definitely i don't speak afrikaans so like having to see those challenges um i um had it, the opportunity to get to meet with some of my friends that are building communities and also into the open source community space so we created the open source community africa with the ability to you know work 
into defining what open source is in the continent of Africa, but also to build awareness. So it was kind of a two-way street in terms of like what we do. Um, and within the organization itself, we have, um, we created a flagship event, uh, which is big, called the Open Source Festival. It's kind of an under three days event where we bring people locally, but also abroad, and then we host them in the space. And they talk about everything open source from Web3 to blockchain to web development to technical writing. You know, basically talking about a lot of things that could develop the human capital. But also, um, one of the interesting ones that I'm proud of is the fact that uh, we created a city, city, a local city chapter program. And just like the way it's, it's uh, the way um, but it, it's been said, it means that we be, basically bring open source down to the local communities. Uh, we started in my city. So I live in, a, in the, the, probably the third largest city in Nigeria called Port Harcourt, which is the oil uh, based city. We started in there and um, the, the reception was great. And then we move over to the largest uh, city in Africa, which is Lagos. And eventually we moved over to a different part. And one of the concept of having the city chapter program is to have the opportunity to not just bring the definition of open source from like the Western world and come and open source means in the community. So we sort of create a framework that enable or empower the local communities to take open source and to sort of like open source definition and make it uh, local to them. So that means that people can now take things and make it very local and then solve local challenges. So the city chapter program basically support um, things like that. And as of right now, we support roughly around 60 to 70 cities across Africa. I think um, in terms of the the, how we define it. There's a lot of um, representation from West Africa. Obviously, uh, we also have um, in Eastern Africa. We do have some couple in Southern Africa, and I think some other fewer ones in Central Africa, where we're trying to see how we can support uh, people over in the Northern part. Because again, there's uh, the language barrier in terms of like, you know, Arabic. So which is something that uh, we've been trying to solve. But again, the open source community Africa is designed specifically to work on advocacy, but also to localize what open source is to the continent of Africa. Because of course, Africa is not a country. It's a country with over 50 countries. And you know, out of, out of that you know, demography, my country, although Nigeria, happens to speak over 500 languages. So like trying to like generalize things are things that are, you know, it would be crazy. So that's why we're working really hard to define uh, um, you know, what open source is in Africa using the open source community Africa. So I think that's kind of a general overview of, 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 uh, of what um, I run here in the continent. Great. Thanks so much, Samson. Um, I've spent a couple of weeks in PH and I think at surface level, I, I was shocked to hear that you had such success with open source in, in that city with the dominance of oil and gas. So congratulations on all of that. Um, next we'll hear from Dushan on your work at the World Health Organization and its global focus in government. Hi, Jamala. Hello, can you hear me? All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, and uh, thank you, Priti and Samson, for a really, really interesting uh, overview. I think I, I, I hope I'll be uh, close to uh, what you're doing because it's really exciting, exciting to, to, to hear um, the ideas in India. And there's some overlap with what we are thinking on the global level as well. And, and um, also, what uh, I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit more about uh, our new plans that we find exciting as well, um, closely um, correspond and, and need initiatives like Samsung has uh, all over Africa. So as, as Mala said, I'm a health intelligence architect in WHO, and that's maybe a relatively new term. So I'll tell you what, what we do uh, first, and, and then you know, I can leave details for discussion. So, uh, I mean, you know, the WHO is, uh, everybody knows WHO is kind of policy making organization and agency of United Nations that, that basically is responsible to coordinate efforts uh, related to, to the population health on a global level. Uh, but there is one part of WHO that is more operational. It became, um, it started back in 2015 after um, uh, the first Ebola outbreak in Western Africa. 
And uh, within the mandate to strengthen and coordinate global health security, the, the World Health Organization conducts ongoing global surveillance, maybe you didn't know that, for public health threats and hazards, um, including early detection, verification, and then rapid assessment of risks to provide timely and actionable intelligence to decision makers uh, in all stages of health emergency management from prediction through prevention, you know, preparedness, response, and recovery. Um, you know, people know about traditional disease surveillance or, or have intuition about it. And it's, it's really about collecting data about patients and, and lab results and, and the different relevant uh, biomedical and, and behavioral and, and uh, socio-demographic information to, to and, and diagnosis of specific diseases and then compare the trends over time and basically comparing the trends, uh, trying to understand uh, uh, what is going on based on the, on the new information about disease incident in any particular place. So this is a traditional way. Now, when you combine this information with an objective to basically detect that something is going on before it becomes uh, official information, and when you then, in order to understand that, that unofficial data, you need to have access and, and basically compare um, and put this into the context. So basically uh, gathering more information about um, um, geography, social factors, environment, travel and trade, animal health, environment health. Um, then then you, we start talking about something that uh, we name public health intelligence. So basically public health intelligence itself is a core function of public health, one of the core functions uh, with objective to get and generate actionable insights for decision making. Um, so that's that's a background of, of what we're doing. And then in that context, um, not only because of the lessons learned with COVID-19, but because of our couple of decades experience and, and more in the public health domain, um, uh, we got an opportunity finally to um, basically um, start practically with a new approach. We gave it a name, collaborative intelligence. And that name has been heard recently when the new hub, WHO hub for pandemic and epidemic intelligence has been inaugurated. Um, and basically that term captures the essence of WHO's new approach, um, collaborative and intelligence. So, so basically to improve the assessment and management of public health risks, um, the collaborative intelligence, public health intelligence is needed across four areas. And this four years is important for then discussion about you know, um, how to um, uh, practically achieve this collaboration. So first, uh, we need multidisciplinary collaboration, um, which basically is a synthesis of many different types of contextual information about the circumstances in which pandemics, epidemics occur. So, so I said, it's a context that's important. Then we have multi-stakeholder decision-making that is a second area that, that um, uh, needs to be addressed. And that means interaction across many stakeholders in political, public policy, scientific, civil society organizations, um, I would say private sector as well, who are then required to use pandemic epidemic intelligence outputs to manage and respond when there are public health emergencies or to prevent them. Uh, in order to have this collaboration um, uh, and to, to make it really possible, we need to establish a trust architecture. That's a for our fourth goal, which is basically global trust architecture. I don't mean only, te only technology. Technology should support the global platform um, that promotes greater sharing of data, information, insights, and knowledge between communities and countries for public good. Um, I come from WHO, so when, when we say countries, we mean every single country, not, not some countries. And you know, it's not about continents and countries and geopolitics. It's about all of us living in the same planet. Um, and the fourth aspect in the fourth area, uh, alongside the multidisciplinary population, multi-stakeholder decision-making and trust architecture is basically a technical part. Uh, we need to, to provide a truly distributed information exchange. And in that, that context, it's really uh, interesting what Christy referred to in India. So basically we are also working on knowledge sharing through global, through developing from, from scratch, basically we talk, because we don't have it, the global network information systems and data sets that facilitate effective human, human machine uh, decision-making or, or using um, um, uh, or augmenting, you know, human decision-making making with machine processing. Um, we do have a worldwide web uh, as, as we know, and this is Internet Governance Forum, but World Wide Web, unfortunately, as some of you might know, is not used uh, in a way it is used in different disciplines, not used in health. 
and I don't mean only public health, it's, it's across the board from healthcare, from individual health to population health. Uh, so basically, you know, we, the intention is that the new WHO hub for pandemic epidemic intelligence will be catalyst for creating this new approach. Um, and uh, underlying the collaboration and collaborative intelligence is the concept of open, open innovations and the technology part of it, which we call open source or, or open source software. And I would say uh, openly sharing of data, information, insights, and knowledge. So what are we going to do about that? Well, for the first time uh, in, in our history, we, we plan to, to tackle this problem uh, in an organized way and to provide the support for the communities and projects that would like to uh, use or create open source software uh, or, or openly share information, insights, and knowledge. So we'll create a new open source program office within uh, the context of WHO Hub for Pandemic Epidemic Intelligence. But that would be truly WHO open source program office that supports and provide support to any projects internally WHO, but also I mean, worldwide. And um, with that, maybe just a few few notes um, uh, or reminders about about where WHO stands really when it comes to collaboration. And what's our point of view? So. So basically the working principles behind these um, uh, projects and primary initiatives uh, of WHO Hub are maybe the following six. First, uh, we need to make sure that we have ethical design and, and Mala mentioned a few valid points um, just minutes ago. So basically um, intelligence systems will have to adopt approach to, to achieve data privacy and confidentiality, security, ethical use uh, of information, uh, from clinical data uh, onwards. Uh, so this is really um, uh, promotional integration of information and custodianship of data at source, uh, rather than taking data from the source and then process it, it uh, will, will help and, and basically um, support sharing of data insights and participation. So that's one, one important thing. Then, then equity, uh, well, being WHO and harnessing the mandate and role of WHO, the hub will work for the benefit of all population, populations, as I said and particularly address the unfair and avoidable differences in access to intelligence systems and knowledge and insights, and then also participation, irrespective of social, economic, demographic, geographical factors. Um, then we, of course, uh, naturally will foster exploration innovation uh, through different approaches. Um, as I said, this is, this is an entity that should collaborate with external world. Um, then multiplicity, of course. I mean, uh, it's it's not possible to achieve this big goal with having just one initiative or a couple of projects, for example, sitting in WHO. Uh, really, we, we want to foster collaboration between people and reuse, as Mala mentioned, which is a rare, rare um, uh, thing these days. Um, interdependence, uh, we are all interdependent and not only you know, technology wise, and but also, I mean, we're interdependent with nature. So we, we have this one health approach, meaning we don't only monitor human, but animal and environment health and the planet as a whole. And then I will end uh, this opening remark with uh, reminding again about the openness as, 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 as the other principle, uh, that basically WHO Hub will promote the use, I would say already promotes, the use and creation of open source technology solutions, as well as the widest possible access to insights to generate um, public health intelligence activities. And then this includes development and promotion of platforms and tools that are available to members of the public and that maximize citizens science opportunities as well. Um, and with that, um, I will uh, stop with open remark. Over to you, Mala. Thanks so much, Dushan. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Kriti, Samson, and Dushan, for those interesting insights. Every time I listen to you, I, I learned a lot more, so I appreciate that. Um, before we turn it over to questions from the audience, I do have a couple of questions myself that I'd love to pose. So Kriti and Samson, especially, you've both mentioned quite a lot about the non-technical aspects of open source. So we, we all know that open source can refer to code, which can be many different types. Uh, it can also refer to text content or data, which I know, Dushan, that's something you work with a lot. I was wondering, um, Kriti and Samson, if you could tell us more about the community building aspects that you focus on, because that's such a critical part of open source that I think honestly is underplayed both in education and just really with dialogue. Kriti you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Sure, sure I, can, uh, I can take that. Um, 
so, you know, in, in the uh, open digital ecosystems uh, framework, we essentially look at all digital infrastructure as having these sort of three layers, right? The, the core technology, the governance and the community layer. Uh, and when we talk about the community layer, we're really referring to, um, you know, uh, a few different groups of people. You know, one is the, the entrepreneurs and open source developers uh, who build not only the core digital infrastructure, but also the solutions on top of it. And then there's also the civil society uh, folks who ensure, um, you know, continuous improvement and hold the government to account. Um, so just to give an example, you know, the civil society engagement uh, around the digital ID Aadhaar in India actually led to a fundamental right to privacy being enshrined in the uh, constitution and legal guardrails on, on where and how, uh, you know, Aadhaar may be used. Um, and, you know, coming to um, the uh, the current state of, uh, you know, open source communities and the kind of sort of, um, you know, challenges and opportunities that they face in India, I think one of the, um, so there was a, a study recently conducted on the state of uh, force in India by uh, an organization called Civic Data Lab um, in, in partnership with, with us. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that they found is that in spite of, uh, you know, a, a huge volume of open source usage uh, from India, uh, we do seem to sort of lag behind in terms of valuable contributions and innovations uh, in spite of the large, uh, you know, tech talent pool. And, and so they spoke to, uh, you know, folks in, in some of the larger OSS communities. And some of the reasons that they uncovered were, um, you know, one is that the, the organizational capacity to, to really sustain a group of mostly young, um, you know, volunteer developers over a long period of time is really lacking. Um, and they need all kinds of support uh, from government incentives to, you know, some of the large uh, tech industry employers also creating the kind of spaces where, um, you know, this kind of work can happen. Um, I think secondly, uh, you know, force led technical education hasn't really permeated uh, at the ground level, except in a few states in India like Kerala, uh, you know, which has a rich uh, sort of history of open source advocacy. Um, and thirdly, there's, there's also not enough, um, you know, commitment uh, and, uh, you know, to open source uh, support from, you know, some of the uh, mainstream IT uh, companies, etc. Right, as, as well as you know, the government, which in spite of having a policy on paper uh, uh, about preference uh, being given to uh, open source technology in public procurement has not really uh, you know, necessarily been able to implement this. Um, I think, um, you know, just want to mention that in spite of many of these barriers, one of the uh, great examples of how um, open source communities have already contributed to, uh, to digital inclusion in India um, is the collaborative work that has happened uh, on creation of Indic language tools, uh, you know, fonts, dictionaries, and, and other, uh, you know, pieces of this localization layer, um, which is really essential in, you know, for digital inclusion in a country like ours with so many, uh, you know, so much linguistic and cultural uh, diversity, and exactly what Samson was saying about the um, African continent as well. I don't know if I've uh, answered your question, but. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, Samson, if you have a few remarks, and then I see we have a question from the audience, so I want to make sure we get sure. to that. Sure. Um, can you hear me? It's good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I think I think the technical aspect of open source is, um, in my opinion, um, I think it's already sustainable. I am an open source contributor myself, and there's a, I've been in a major project for roughly around 11, 12 years now, like basically more than half of my life, I guess. Um, and I think for me, the reason why I'm particularly focused on community is because that's where the biggest problem is in open source in general. There's still a diversity problem, um, and also obviously like there's a pipeline problem, particularly on the continent. Um, the way the open source community Africa started was when I went to Mountain View for the first time and attended a conference in Google, there was a, a project that was, I, was, I was helping Google to run. Um, basically about 99.9% .9 of people were definitely not Africans, right? And I told myself, I was like, okay, this is something that needs to be fixed. And I had a chat with the team and they were like, oh, um, at the moment we can't, you know, obviously the remote was kind of a, a myth back then, where it's like, oh, we don't have any staff in there that could support, you know, originally, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we need to, like, work on um, that we need to definitely get into. Of course, the programs were global, but obviously they were, like, lacking that 
define the future. And so I had to, you know, take it upon myself and call, of course, with some of my colleagues to, you know, basically work on the pipeline side. As of right now, uh, the population of the, uh, of Nigeria, using Nigeria as a case study, uh, roughly around 60% of the population are under the age of 30. So what that means is that every single day you see someone coming into tech. You know, if you go to tech Twitter right now, um, there's someone, you know, jumping into one framework or jumping into one language or even getting a job. But no one is basically, the numbers of like collaboration, building open source tools, uh, there, because of obviously the, the recent effort that has been happening on the continent, but um, some people don't really see it as a as something that they could participate on, or even even um, see it as a way to like join. And, and if you look into like, uh, I think GitHub actually highlighted um, some of the efforts using the Octoverse. I think there's a Made in Africa list right now of a bunch of open source tools that are coming from the continent. There's even one specifically for Nigeria called the Made in Nigeria list um, being maintained by one of my friends called Ace Kid. Um, to show that you know the community aspect of it is as important as a technical because of course, the effort I've been doing uh, for quite some time and been able to drive um, um, basically the technical aspect of it, like one of the most popular open source project right now on the continent is called Chakra UI, which is a basically a Java, uh, JavaScript framework that a lot of companies and individuals are using abroad. So where we're, what I'm trying to do is to build the pipeline, but of course, trying to make sure that we have a lot of projects that are out there coming from the continent that the world depend on. So that's kind of like why I think the community aspect is as important as the technical aspect, because we sort of like drive the numbers uh, driving the community numbers basically drive you know the technical aspect of it. So I kind of see them as as a as as you know a joint effort. So, yeah. Yes, abs absolutely. Thank you so much, Samson and Creepy, for those insights. Um, I see we have a question from the audience, so please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Asim Adeem, and uh, I'm an IT consultant. I'm based in uh, Frankfurt. Uh, my uh, question about, uh, I always believe on open source and there is a lot of big community which is providing a lot of uh, different solutions. Uh, focusing on that can help us to develop some kind of uh, infrastructure. But when we come on the uh, government level, uh, we are aware about the data vulnerabilities and uh, now we are facing a lot of uh, digital threats. Uh, for that, for do you think like there should be some open source software assessment framework or something like that that while selecting some uh, chunk of code you can actually assess it uh, uh, and you can evaluate that if it is usable for you or not uh, is there someone do you know who is working on it um, yeah, thank you for the question. I wish Saeed were here. I think you would have been perfect to answer this question, but it is an important issue that you raised about just the security and the vulnerabilities that are inherent in any government service or um, yeah, offering. I think, Dushan, since the World Health Organization does work quite a lot with different governments, would love to hear your perspective on this. And then, Creepy, I know you're a researcher, and um, I'm sure the Indian government has come up quite a few times in your work, so I'd love to hear from you after, Dushan. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mark. Thanks for the question. Question, it's 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 a really important question. That uh, I'm not sure I can speak uh, in the name of the governments, but I can certainly speak uh, in the name of the WHO and what we do together with the IT department. So basically, I told you that uh, that we have this plan to create an um, open source program office that should provide multidisciplinary support, uh, legal procurement, um, capacity building, community, and technical. And so, you know, the governance part consists of technical parts as well. So, so um, before agreeing and, and um, securing the acceptance of all the stakeholders at WHO, I need to talk with the head of cybersecurity, you know, CTO, and the others. And basically, you know, it boils down really to, to um, if you want um, uh, recommendations and, 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 and development methodology, you know, so if you want to use open source software, so basically we're building a number of recommendations for uh, suggesting the steps, you know, you need to take, you know, yeah, if you want to use um, uh, some open source software or if you want to provide um, uh, open source uh, software uh, before design, I mean, uh, before, before doing programming, you, know, you need to uh, uh, do the proper design, the architecture, 
uh, within context, you need to also assess um, and make sure that, that security and confidentiality uh, rules and principles are applied. Security when it comes to the software and communications, confidentiality or privacy, or data protection in general when it comes also to data, data architecture as well. So this is, this is our approach. It's, it's, it's technical. And I think that the, 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 the problem is technical rather than governance and principles. And there is also, in my opinion, from experience, it's really difficult to have one size fits all framework. I mean, it can be on very general level, yes, uh, like development methodologies and which, uh, which questions needs to be asked first. But uh, to have a technical framework, a tool that can help you to basically uh, um, answer these questions is, is, is really difficult. I mean, there's this vulnerability checkers, for example, GitHub that we're using the uh, It works nicely for us, I would say so far. Uh, but you know, these are just tools that would apply in some cases and would not in some others. Over. Kriti, anything to add? Yeah, um, I think the only thing I'll add is, you know, in my in my sort of limited uh, non-technical understanding, uh, you know, when it comes to government uh, adopting open source, um, the degree to which, uh, you know, the uh, data security and data privacy uh, are concerns, uh, you know, really depends on the, the type of data uh, that you're looking at. So there, you know, now in India, um, there's a legally defined personal data and non-personal data. Uh, and I think the, the government's understanding has evolved uh, on this quite a lot in the last couple of years, um, given the sort of legislative discussions that are happening around these different types of data and what are the kinds of, um, you know, security and privacy concerns around these. Um, but in my sort of discussions with, uh, with government stakeholders, you know, at the Ministry of IT uh, and so on, uh, what has really come to the surface is that it is not um, that these are not really the primary uh, barriers uh, for government to adopt open source. Um, uh, what what is really a barrier is um, is the you know how to do procurement, uh, you know, and that's a whole you know different problem uh, to solve there. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, just to kind of go off the point that Dushan made. So from a product perspective, the, the tool is called Dependabot. So basically if you're ingesting any kind of open source packages, then Dependabot will scan all of your code and then tell you what you're using. And so you can do something called an action, which is an automation to basically automatically update your software every time something is released that's you know a new critical security update, for example. And then um, I definitely hear what Creepy is saying that a lot of the barriers to open source. So a lot of my colleagues will say that open source is never inherently any less or more secure than proprietary software. It's all about the, the structure of the code and how well it's done. And then even open source can get around some security barriers because it is open and transparent. So it's in some ways easier to troubleshoot the issues. Um, I see we have a question from the audience here on Zoom. So Alan, would you like to go ahead? Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Okay, first of all, my name is Alan I'm from Kenya. And uh, um, mine is more, I don't know whether there are questions or comments, but uh, just recording maybe the overall uh, discussion that is going on. Uh, personally, I've been involved also in uh, areas around open science for quite some time, mostly around in the education system and also in health science specifically. So I would probably uh, touched on mostly most of the speakers because even Kenya itself actually is a member of the Open Government Partnership, which we are actually a true key. So whatever was being mentioned in India, I think I relate quite really well in terms of Kenya. And I think in Africa, I think Kenya is one of the leaders when it comes to the Open Government Partnerships. But also when it comes to the, I don't know exactly what Dushan really, what the department really means uh, aim to, because I know UNESCO are really doing a lot of work also in terms of the uh, Open Science. Part of it, I don't know exactly when when you know, when the WHO wants to really uh, leverage open science. Are they talking of biobanks or open biobanks exactly? And also, does it also mean also uh, having uh, guiding principles, especially related to the collection, uh, processing, and use of uh, storage of human human data? I think those are some of the ethical issues that maybe I want to be really hear exactly how WHO is working on that. And especially, I know UNESCO personally have been really quite involved in areas around open science because someone asked about open science framework. I probably can refer them to check the UNESCO website. They just launched it last month. Uh, 
uh, open the UNESCO recommendation on open science framework. It was it's a, a, an agreeable document by government, and it was endorsed uh, last month by the UNESCO governing council. So those are some of the government areas are around open science uh, that are taking place at the moment. But nonetheless, good discussion happening at the IGF. Yeah, thank, thanks, <laughs> thanks for the remark, Solon. I, I think you, um, your your point is actually uh, it's 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 a pivotal thing that we're talking about and, and uh, around which we are organizing the approach. So, um, I, there are a couple of us, but I'll, I'll tell you, I'll answer you directly that that actually yes, we're talking about uh, uh, creating creating um, an environment for the true open science. And I'll tell you how we see that. So, so you mentioned um, uh, the data side of it, and the data side of it is uh, complex as it is. Um, um, open Biobank, for example, if you refer to UK, Open Biobank or, or any other um, is uh, a reality. We have these initiatives uh, on, on many places. And for obvious reasons, uh, information there uh, has its own confidentiality. And as, as uh, Gritty mentioned, I mean, depending on the data, I mean, there are different aspects to, to the privacy, nevertheless. So um, how do we, because I'm an architect and more on, on the solution side, I can tell you um, uh, more about solution side uh, than, than governance and politics and whatnot. But on the solution side, what we what we plan to do is a couple of things. First thing is very ambitious, and that is really to create a network. If you want uh, to to annotate all this information using a linked data principle, meaning really to expose this information for first time ever on the World Wide Web, uh, from out of, to, to expose the types. So so what exists there, not the values that might be confidential, but for the first time to to create the possibility to search for information if you don't know about existing biobank. Um, and, and then, you know, it's also um, between data custodian, between data owners primarily, and I mentioned citizens, because actually data owners are citizens, and some citizens already um, have uh, initiatives to share their data. You don't need to pay them. I mean, there is in, in the, in the no global north or more, or more developed countries, there's an idea to, to monetize information, to basically incentivize people to share health relevant information uh, and then some polls show that this is a wrong initiative because people some people will pay you to use their information you don't need to pay them so basically i mean that there's a lot of work to be done there but um, on the technical side we acknowledge the the, the, the the fact and the reality that will stay forever that we won't be able to take information uh, that might be useful and then process it somewhere outside of where it sits in secure environment so we want to have this solution of you know, uh, linking on the World Wide Web or these different information systems. And number two, um, if it's not possible to take raw information of some kind of values, then we can process information there where they are. So some kind of federative analytics. Um, and that brings me to a second aspect. I mean, you know, open science, and that's less talked um, uh, recently, we and some others are trying to raise the topic. Open science also means open analytics. I mean. Uh, most analytical models and most of the you know, analysis, I mean, every single analysis and data brings bias with it. And most analytical models, especially these more advanced ones like machine learning and, and, and similar, um, are pretty much opaque and closed, especially if they come from the private sector, but also from the public. So, you know, you have a function and you don't know why some weights or certain variables are put by the author of that model in the way they are, because we don't have mechanisms and if you want information uh, and communication technology infrastructure to, to open and explain these models. And, you know, COVID-19 and government decisions are the best example of, of that. Actually, we don't know what's going on two years on. I mean, and, and, and we have a models that are based on the previous knowledge but also these models are not fully clear to everyone. I mean, um, maybe I can give you one example briefly and stop with that, maybe it's interesting. So we had a, a discussion one month ago, maybe in, in Berlin, in Technical University of Berlin, in Fraunhofer Heinrich-Hertz Institute with a number of very smart people from um, Applied Machine Learning Lab there, uh, basically talking about what we are doing and what they're doing and exploring ways for collaboration. And they presented a very interesting model to predict um, a transmission of a SARS-CoV-2 virus in, in a closed environment. 
and basically to, to um, classify <laughs> the, the probability between high and low probability as a threshold, they used what they believed the scientifically proved concept in which if you are closer to two, the two meters to a person for longer than um, uh, five minutes, uh, you have a chance to you have a very high probability to be um, infected. Um, and actually, uh, it was interesting because one of the co our colleagues who was on the meeting was on the meeting in WHO at the very beginning of the, of the onset of this uh, outbreak. And uh, that was a decision, a guesstimate decision made of the meeting because we don't have facts and criteria to know. This is difficult to know. And this is now inbuilt as, as a fact in many models worldwide. So, you know, we don't have, it's maybe in the minutes of meeting that fact. But you know, we need to expose this information. We need to so, say to the world, okay, this is, you know, a minutes, it's time and place, it's a spatial temporal information, but it's not based on fact, it's assumption. So this metadata, it's assumption and where it comes from doesn't exist. So this is a big, big problem of having true open science. And maybe third part is, you know, but that's, that's another topic uh, completely, is, is this uh, publish or perish in academia problem in which, you know, you really uh, don't sustain your research on a topic. You simply need to publish uh, what's publishable and publishable what editor of the magazines think it's publishable, not really what the topic is. So yeah, that's that's our, our take on the open science. And we will um, uh, address all, all these three aspects of Thank you, Dushan and Alan for that, those insights. Um, so I have a couple more questions if there's no, nothing else from the audience. So the first one is for all the different aspects of open source, whether you're talking about open mathematical models or code or text or governance, when it comes to the actual community building aspects, what do you, each of the panelists think needs to improve or change? So um, Dushan, since you're on the subject, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I, I think I said that's actually, it's, it's really, it's really going back to the basics where we were maybe last century or so. Um, um, maybe just to, to continue what I said and then to add another, another dimension to, to what I said, which actually answers your question, I think. Uh, we have industrialization of knowledge. I mean, um, again, I'll, I'll speak uh, from, from the health domain. You have something called digital health. And personally, I don't know what digital means. I, I'm, I'm technology, I'm information communication technology, engineer, you could be the scientist, I know what digital and analog means, but why putting digital next to health? You have intelligent health. Is there unintelligent health? So these are all buzzwords, you know, for different things. And then worst of them all, you have healthcare industry. I mean, it's not an industry, it's a private relationship between a tenant physician and a patient, and everything depends on that trust. Everything should support that trust. We, we are far away, uh, especially in the developed world from these concepts, and I think that actually uh, hinders, you know, openness, including open source software. In my experience with, uh, and I won't call them big tech, I will call them hyperscalers. I like this, this term because I think that's the most, uh, you know, close, close to, the closest to what they really do. So all these big tech hyperscalers, um, ba basically when we work with them, if they want to open source, they will, for example, suggest Apache 2.0 license because they would like to fork it and have a, then copyright if it's useful, if they can commercialize. Or actually, commercialization is okay if they want to put the property. So if you want to use, for example, mathematical model, you need to pay the royalties. And this is very, very dangerous game that we're facing, and it's it's ongoing, especially now with COVID-19. So we need to change the culture. I mean, I, I know it sounds like utopia, but we did it in the past couple of times. Uh, some were wrong, some were right. So yeah, it's it's less tech, it's more culture and, and approach. Great, okay, thank you. Um, so same question to Samson and Creepy, and then I'd also like to add a concluding question. So how can people get involved in your work and what would be a meaningful contribution to you? So. Uh, Samson, would you like to go? Sure. So, um, so for me, I think what the most important thing here would be uh, from the uh, government side of things. I've, I've, um, I think that's what I try to work with the African Union um, to try to get more rich. So I think more rich um, in terms of like local communities will be very important for me. But also, I think. Um, is obviously the biggest aspect of um, one of my biggest challenges, obviously, uh, has been coming from, 
funding, but I've been able to like uh, think about clever ways to like bring funding into the project that I run. So basically, um, I the Open Source Community in Africa run a uh, one big event called the Open Source Festival, which we uh, use to like get to like pitch to corporate companies. And we get funding from those organizations and we get to get that fund into the organization and then spread it across um, the smaller community that we run locally. Um, so I think the most important thing here would be to, you know, work with communities, organizations or not probably including governments that um, would basically help in terms of like, getting more funds. But aside from that, I think um, awareness is as important as the funds. So, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that would be my act. Hey, thanks so much. Um, Creepy, if you could respond quickly. Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, Mala, in the Indian context, I think uh, when I think about, you know, what should be the way forward or, or what needs to improve, um, you know, to support uh, open source communities here, um, I think the, the key sort of missing uh, thing is uh, a kind of institution that can bring together both capital and capacity building. Uh, and so one of the, the ongoing conversations, um, you know, that we've been having is the idea of setting up some kind of a open source a center of excellence that can act as a kind of institutional backbone uh, for promoting the uh, development and adoption of open source software. Um, and, and a range of interventions, uh, you know, can be housed under this kind of an institution from, you know, advocating for uh, open source led curriculum in tech schools to facilitating uh, collaboration amongst the existing open source communities to funding and incubating, uh, you know, high impact open source projects, especially for uh, sort of population scale use cases um, uh, to, you know, many other such initiatives, including some of the ones that that Samson spoke about that he, uh, you know, is working on with the um, Africa open source community as well. Um, in terms of collaborations, actually, I think, uh, you know, some of the folks on this panel are a great example of the kind of, uh, you know, collaborators we would seek. Um, you know, so you'd love, love to learn from uh, folks who've, uh, who've sort of set up successful, uh, sustainable models uh, of open source communities in the developing country context. Um, and GitHub uh, as well, uh, you know, we've been speaking to, uh, to you in India as a potential partner for the Open Source Center of Excellence. Uh, and similarly, uh, you know, Dushan, uh, you know, to bring in sort of learnings um uh in terms of uh, sort of digital infrastructure at a, at a very large uh, thinking about it at a very large scale um so yeah uh, you know pretty much um you know anybody who's working on uh, large scale open source use cases uh, would be a great potential collaborator for this kind of work wonderful thanks so much um alan i know you had a quick question but unfortunately we're almost out of time so i will do my best to make sure that question gets answered after this panel um, thank you all to the audience and, of course, to our panelists for joining today. I know it's uh, always challenging with hybrid events, but I do appreciate your patience as we got everything settled. Um, I think just a quick closing remark. So I, there a lot, there's obviously a lot of expertise uh, here in this room, and I think one of the expertise that's kind of undervalued really is just cross-sectoral, um, whether it's the private sector, the social sector, or the government's uh, public sector. There are institutions and organizations that do very well in different aspects of open source governance. And so I do encourage you to reach out to people at different parts of the industry and really figure out how to, to play off of you know, those strategies. So thank you all for coming and uh, have a great conference. Bye.